This is the second part of the United Universities of Europe panel discussion from Berlin. Um, after the first half, um, we are now um, talking with uh, Peter von der Heiden, our man in Brussels. Hello, Peter. Peter, we have Peter, been, uh, starting we have been this whole uh, conversation about the professions in the European University Alliance. Um, um, when we noticed that they are structured like research projects in work packages with certain topical fields which reflect um, um, the, um, the tasks and the working fields um, and the professions in these alliances. No? Um, do you think that, um, that um, this, um, um, this university alliances are crea creating a new, a, new, um, how you say, a new group of staff, a new, a new profession? Yeah, I think so. Uh, listening to the colleagues, uh, uh, the, the big change is uh, uh, the, the scope and extent, as Catherine said, and the speed. Now, what does it mean for the jobs? Uh, it is creating new jobs, uh, like directors, coordinators. The job of Tino, uh, our, our kind host today, is, is a new job, you could say. But more exciting and more deeper for me is the, the transfer of the old jobs. Uh, and those old jobs are the people that I call the gang of 500. And they, those are the 500 alliance task managers. And they do the real work of the alliance. And those people have a job. They have a regular job in, in administration, education, uh, research, and innovation. They are, for example, program directors locally. They are responsible for the virtual campus locally. They are responsible for HR, for the library. They are researchers and teachers. But now, all of a the sudden, they find themselves to collaborate in the Alliance task teams. And they are now building uh, the course catalog for the Alliance, what they used to do on their own. They are building the virtual campus for the Alliance, what they used to do on their own. They are working in HR on a, on a, a tenure for the whole Alliance. So you can move jobs between the institutions. They are working on open science for their institution, but now in a task team for the entire alliance. And this is a change for those professionals. Uh, it's a kind of an upgrading. It helps them to benchmarking, to become better professionals. It also helps to integrate the members of the alliance to a certain extent. Uh, it's a partial merger. But if you focus on the professional aspect, this is, uh, this is motivational. This motivates these people uh, they suddenly, and that's uh, the perspective that I want to give, when you work in an alliance task team for the library, for the HR, for the student admission, you have a career perspective. Locally, of course, but also in the alliance. You may, at some point, shorter or longer time, go work in another institution as part of the alliance. When the kids uh, leave the house, you can go for one year to Finland or to Rome because you have a career in the Alliance, even hopping other alliances, as we were just encouraged to do uh, by the colleagues, putting forward their, their, uh, their vacancies. So for me, that is something motivating and it changes the nature of your work. It makes you start dreaming, even if you never leave the place where you work. In UFO, they call this the, 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 the staff journey. Uh, and I think it's a good idea, Tino, that you put the gang of 500 in the limelight, next to our dear coordinators and presidents, of course. Thank you, Peter, for this brief intermission. And we come directly to Eva Maria Feichner, um, the Vice President um, for International Relations at the University of Bremen. Um, Eva, hello. I know you have to go at one o'clock, so we have to we have to be quick with you. The interesting thing is, the interesting thing is, on one side we have seen how the coordinators and the work package leaders and the people who uh, who project officers for the alliance are working. Now we're seeing your perspective as the uh, vice president responsible for for the staff and for um, for um, the management of the university alliance, right? Um, so um, this keyword staff journey. What does it? Uh, how does it relate to the jobs that these people have? Well, let's start from the idea of a student journey because I guess that's more familiar to all, to all of us. So we want students to move all of all over Europe, all over our our different country. And now our idea at UFO was um, 
it's not only your studies, life is a journey, professional life is a journey. And we want our, our we are, we're convinced that if we want students to move around, the institutions can't be solid. The people working at the institutions can't be purely home-based. They must have this experience themselves. So that what brought us to uh, concentrating on the staff journey. So enabling our yeah, employees, enabling everybody working in the university environment to go out, to go out, experience the European, the, the building up of the European university, go out, experience how their profession is carried out somewhere else. Go and connect, go and uh, live with others and learn and uh, develop. So um, we're thinking of that as a very physical thing, right? We wanted to, we wanted people to go out on uh, job shadowing projects and things like that. Well, we all know the pandemic has cut that short, uh, pretty much brought it down to zero. And what we did, and I think that was pretty successful, what we did is to quickly come up with training programs, uh, virtual training problem, uh, programs that brought together people who otherwise wouldn't have met in the same way. So as, as Peter pointed out, the librarian, the HR uh, uh, expert, and so they had the opportunity in a very low threshold way to meet, to connect. In a way, the pandemic has helped us to become more inclusive. I mean, just think for a moment, you just mentioned, well, the kids have left the house, I can go for a year somewhere. That's the answer we get from many people whom we try to get moving. They say, well, no, I mean, I have three kids in school. What do you think? I'm not moving anywhere. And by the way, there's a pile of work. And now I can go and tell them, well, uh, there's a staff training tomorrow at two o'clock. It lasts for two hours. You can meet your colleagues in Finland. You can meet your colleagues in Spain. That's your opportunity to experience Europe. And people do. And people come back to us and say, you know, that was great. And, you know, I'll seriously think about going out now and taking up this burden of organizing everything around because I want to experience the real thing. So we are all waiting for the pandemic to be over to get back to a new normal where people can actually um, take up what they have started digitally now. Um, we um, have to also, we to, have cut also to cut this short because um, uh, Jörg Niehoff from the European Commission uh, uh, wants to leave at one o'clock. But we have time for one more question, um, Eva. Um, um, we have been talking about lifelong learning. That is, um, uh, people who, who uh, leave university to become um, uh, professionals, but maybe come back. Um, how can the alliances contribute to this? I work on uh, offering of lifelong learning to people in a more uh, close to their job way than universities were doing that uh, way back. Um, so our dream is that our graduates go out and don't forget UFE, but come and visit every now and then for professional development courses, for uh, maybe taking up the role of a, of a professional expert, advising our students, working together in uh, challenge teams or the like. So I think uh, our professional development in its true sense lives from changing pers perspectives. In the same way, we want researchers to take every now and then the position of a professional service staff member and vice versa. And we want people to go out and come back from our, from our alliance. So that's, that's what I think is the, the truly enriching thing we can, we can work on. This is the old communist idea to send the intellectuals to the camps. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a peculiar way, way to think about it, but maybe yes. Yeah, let's dare to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. wow. Well, that's good. Well, um, Eva, um, I thank you so far. Um, I, th I, th I think I have extended the first part so far that we have to hurry a little bit. So uh, thank you for your for contribution. And um, let's go over to, um, to Jörg Niehoff, who is... Um, 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 co policy coordinator at the European Commission, and um, and let's apply a last different perspective on the question we have today, because the European Commission is um, 
no, well, paying, no, well, other, paying taxpayers, other taxpayers, but, it's, it's, but it's, 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 it's taking the money and putting it into programs to um, to um, to push forward certain developments. And uh, so, Jörg, um, the transformation agenda, how it is called, of the European Commission, uh, where is it going? What is the direction? Yes, thank you, Tino, and uh, good morning to everyone. Well, the transformation agenda is not yet there. So let me perhaps bring the context in here. Some of you might have seen that the Commission has published on the 30th of September two communications that are directly relevant also for higher education institutions. It's the one on the European education area and the one on the European research area. And both put higher education institutions at the core of, of a transformation also of the society. So what we want to do with the stakeholders, in particular with the European universities and with the member states, is to develop by the end of next year a transformation agenda for higher education institutions. And that will not have the uh, TGV speed that Adim called it before, perhaps rather the long distance that the TGV uh, can pass. And it is something that has to be co-created, co-designed with the stakeholders, with the policy makers at national level. What we have identified in our communication are four focus areas that we believe are important. The one is connectivity among higher education institutions, that what we see also with European universities. We we'll bring them in a context to work across borders on common challenges, but also connectivity with their local ecosystem, because that's where you have the societal impact, where you connect to the labor market, and that is extremely important for us. The second element is inclusion. We want to have higher education institutions that are more open to a diverse student and research body. And we had that comment before, also offer better opportunities for lifelong learning, which again makes it necessary to connect to the local ecosystem. Secondly, digital and green. I mean, if you look at all the big policies that we are currently driving, the green and digital transitions at the core of these things. And I think COVID has made us much more aware about the need for digital transition. And there's also a dedicated communication on the digital education action plan. But the green transition is equally important. And there again, higher education institutions are at the core of basically building the workforce and the skills and the competences that we need for the green transition. And that is something that I believe also European universities can drive to a certain extent. And the last one is innovation in higher education in education, in research, in driving transition. So what we expect to see by the end of next year is somehow an, a, an alignment and agreement on what that transformation agenda should look like. What are the incentives that we need in terms of funding coming from different programs, national, European, but also in terms of policy approaches that we need. And what we have learned from other initiatives like the H Innovate initiative that supports the transformation of universities to become more entrepreneurial, more innovative, is that you need the bottom-up approach that we see here, but you also need some of the soft tools, self-reflection questionnaires that allow you to find a common direction where you want to go and the leadership that you need that drives that transition. So you need an understanding where to go, which is direction, the leadership and the commitment to drive that change. And today we look at European universities, but I would really encourage all European universities to look at the other tools that DGA provides, be it labor market information experiences. I mean, a lot of the things that you are trying to drive, they also require that you have a better connectivity to your, to the business to understand what are the requirements in terms of uh, skills, um, transversal skills that you need for future jobs. Hmm. Mm. This, H this H H EI H Innovate instrument, um, how has it been, has it been uh, adopted yet? How, is the, how does it work? So it is something that has been going through a long, long way. It was designed together with the colleagues at the OECD at some point in time. And we have a number of building blocks at the core and that is accessible for all institutions is this self-reflection uh, questionnaire that is also on the internet that has been used by I think 1300 universities across Europe to drive their transition. I think more than 20,000 individuals have used that. So this is something that is not a benchmarking but it is something that allows an institution with training programs and et cetera, to somehow position themselves, where are we today in becoming or in being an entrepreneurial, innovative education institutions? And what are pathways for us to further improve on that? And of course, you can also use that in the context of European universities. We have been contacted by some that want to use the tool as well. The second is that we are having, um, together with the OECD, 
country reviews, where countries approach us directly and say, listen, we want to have your support in analyzing our system and showing pathways for development. We are doing this, for example, currently with Slovenia. And we see that Slovenia is not only using this element of how to become more innovative with the educational system, at the same time, they look also in labor market relevance of universities. So they are using two of our policy support mechanisms to have assistance in designing their master plan for higher education for the next years. And there we are closing a loop because, of course, the countries use our tools to find a way where they want to develop that will inform the consultations for the transformation agenda. And so we, we somehow create a, a common directionality of where we go with the European system to make it overall more competitiveness, more competitive and uh, more powerful in terms of addressing the challenges that we have. Oh, Jörg, oh. thank you so much. Um, this was a very, very fast um, 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 summary of the European policies supporting and uh, um, uh, instructing the European universities. Uh, Jörg, for so far, I thank you very much. Uh, we can summarize that we have seen, on one hand, how inside the European University Alliances, the jobs, the, the positions, um, the professions of coordinators, project officers, and work package leaders are um, creating a new network of uh, professions, of professionals. Um, um, we have also uh, seen, together with Eva-Maria Feichtner, uh, that the university management is, um, is trying to create interesting, attractive um, um, in career paths um, so um, that um, the people who are later, who are now um, steering and creating these university alliances are, are well prepared and are learning all along the way. And also um, we have seen the European uh, Commission um, is uh, supporting uh, these efforts, is also pushing into a direction um, for, for creating new professionals that come out of the university, so to help the universities um, develop um, their educational programs and their research um, into a more European, a more connected Europe. Um, I want to thank all the participants for being today with us. Um, I can only uh, remind, remind again of Dante, who said that we are here to um, acquire virtue and new knowledge, and that is what, in my opinion, the European alliances, university alliances are doing. And I want to thank you all again for uh, being uh, with us today and finish this, um, um, this panel discussion right on time. And invite you for the next one that will be in January. I think it's the 13th of, ge 13th of uh, January, um, the second uh, Tuesday of, um, of the month. Um, there we will talk about the digital campus, about the virtual campus, and um, how digitalization can help uh, to build the alliances and how these alliances can help to, um, to um, improve courses and um, um, scientific education. So thank you all for being um, with us today and well, see you soon and see you in January. Thank you. Goodbye. Arrivederci.